Michael, hi. at the panel on the hot topics, uh, one of the questions asked how to ignite passion into a tester. Uh, can you answer and expand a little bit on that? How can you ignite passion into a tester? I think one of the best ways to do that is not to put the passion out. One of the things that we tend to do, it seems to me, is we tend to restrict people in terms of the way they think, the way they behave, the way they experiment, the way they explore. And I think sometimes when we do that, we inhibit people's uh, ability to be enthusiastic about what they're doing because somebody else becomes responsible for setting their mission, for guiding their discoveries, for uh, directing their interest and their attention. I think when we free people, uh, give them the uh, freedom but also the responsibility to investigate what they like to investigate, to uh, bring back information the way explorers used to bring back information, to discover new things and to, f to follow uh, what they're interested in, then we don't have to ignite the passion. We can allow people to follow the passion that they've already got. Little kids are like that. If you look at a, a child, the way the child investigates and interacts with the world, plays with toys, develops stories, what you'll see is that the kid learns by experimentation, and by elaborating, and by generalizing on things, and by, by copying and slightly modifying other behavior, by creating stories. And I think those kinds of uh, uh, behaviors are things that it, later in life we tend to squash when we send kids to school. At that point, we make other people responsible for what they're going to learn. Other people set the, uh, um, set the d direction that they follow and uh, set the goals that they uh, uh, need to fulfill. I think people are very good at uh, fulfilling their own uh, goals and other people's goals without a lot of specificity. And after all, what we're doing in testing is we're searching for things that nobody has known before, the things that people haven't discovered. And so I think that's very closely tied to the idea uh, of unleashing passion rather than igniting it. One of your comments on the panel was translating how do you ignite passion into how do we inflict passion into a tester? So for a tester that had, that for a tester that had his passion turned off, is it appropriate to turn it on, and how do you do that? I think that in order to bring out the passion in people, I, I, I think we have to bring it out. I don't think we can drive it in. Um, I think the, the, uh, uh, among the, the best ways to do that um, are to make sure that they have the opportunities that they need to investigate and to explore and to discover. Um, I don't think, though, that it's appropriate to try to make somebody passionate if they're not. If they don't like their job, if they don't like what they're doing, you've got a few choices. One is to give them something that they like. One is to uh, help them to see things that might be uh, likable about the, the work that they're doing. Another is to put them together with passionate people who can help to show them the way. Uh, yet another, uh, although it, it sounds kind of uh, uh, harsh perhaps, is to let them go, to let them uh, go to some place that they are passionate about or to, to something. After all, it's a relationship. A person is in a, in a job and in service for a company, um, and that has to be a good fit. Both the company and the person have to fit together, and, and sometimes one isn't a good fit for the other. That's okay. Uh, painful sometimes at first, but uh, it's, it's okay for people to move on when they are finding themselves in a place where they're not fitting very well. Michael, a lot was said on, on the conference about passion obscuring the facts. Would you like to comment on the notion? In the 1800s, there was a fellow called Ignaz Semmelweis. Um, he was a, a doctor in Hungary. He was uh, responsible for two clinics, uh, and uh, they were actually called the first clinic and the second clinic. These clinics were uh, where young and uh, um, indigent mothers uh, went to have their babies. They, did, they couldn't afford regular medical care, and in exchange for that, they agreed to be... Um, subjects of medical students and midwives, medical students at the first clinics and, and uh, midwives at the second. 
there's a disease called puerperal fe fever. And the rate of death at the first clinic was around double, more than double, what the rate of death was at the second clinic, to the degree that women would uh, beg not to be sent to the, the first clinic. Semmelweis, who was responsible for both, was very alarmed at the difference. He was also alarmed at the mortality rate at the clinic. And so he began an investigation. He did tests to control for the difference between these two clinics, first clinic and the second clinic. Looked at many things. Well, the climate, that couldn't be a, a, a different because they were right next to each other. Um, there were a number of other factors that he looked at. And he realized that one of the key differences was the medical students in one building, the first clinic, and midwives in the second. And then he divined that what was going on was that the, after the death of one of his friends through infection, although they didn't know that's what it was at the time, he divined that what was happening was the medical students were going from the morgue to the maternity ward without washing their hands and thereby infecting the women. Now, Semmelweis, who had been very upset about this problem and, and very passionate about trying to solve it, uh, engaged his passion in a way that uh, maybe we would consider inappropriate, which is that he began to uh, call other doctors murderers for not uh, implementing the solution that he had uh, discovered, literally solution of, uh, I believe, lime and, and chloride, the same stuff that goes into bleach these days. That was the stuff that allowed um, uh, the, the smell of the dead bodies to get off the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, medical students' hands. Doctors don't take kindly to being called murderers. Their passion for their position obscured the facts of their circumstance because their models did not allow them to explain why washing your hands should make a difference. So the fact of hand washing and the, the fact of contamination, uh, for which an explanation eventually emerged through uh, Pasteur and, and later the uh, principles of hand washing set up by Lister and other doctors. Since the doctors of the time, the medical students of the time, didn't incorporate, didn't have that explanation, the only conclusion was that Semmelweis must be crazy. His wife saw Semmelweis's agitation and his, his again, his passion for this discovery uh, distort his behavior to the extent that he was committed to a mental institution. Uh, Fourteen days after being committed, he died there, uh, ironically due to infection. What we see there in both cases is a, a set of uh, people having the facts, as they know them, distorted by their own passion. And sometimes we see uh, um, that in arguments about testing, too.